Our next speaker is one of the most passionate voices in Washington, D.C., regarding the critical need to develop a long-term, sustained talent pipeline for agriculture. Dr. Sunny Ramaswamy was appointed to serve as director of the USDA's National Institute of Food and Agriculture, NIFA, in 2012. As part of USDA's research, education, and extension mission, he oversees NIFA's uh, ward funds for a broad range of extramural research, education, and extension projects that address the needs of farmers, ranchers, and agricultural producers. Prior to joining NIFA, Dr. Ramaswamy served as Dean of Oregon State's University College of Agricultural Sciences. He has also held leadership positions both at Purdue University and Kansas State University. Today, Dr. Ramaswamy will share his vision regarding the talent required to feed 9 billion people by 2050. Please join me in welcoming, welcoming him to the stage. Good luck, it's all yours. <laughs> Thanks very much, uh, Philippe, for the kind introduction. And, and uh, Ifama, thank you very much for having me here this afternoon to share some thoughts with you about the talent factor. And it's perfect. I, I, you know, I really have the opportunity to segue from where uh, Hugh uh, left off, talking about the need for partnerships, the need for collaborations, the need for getting started right now, not waiting for the year 2050. 2050 is only a guidepost, but we've got to start doing things right now. So, uh, you know, nor uh, uh, Hugh, in his comments, talked a little bit about uh, Norm Borlaug's contributions to wor the world. And of that one billion people, I'm one of those ones that was saved by uh, Norm Borlaug as well. I grew up in India at a time in the uh, 1950s and 1960s when India was a basket case. It couldn't feed itself. And Norm Borlaug and the American land-grant universities were a very critical part of enabling India and many, many other parts of the world to be able to feed uh, themselves as well. So I'm one of those individuals. And, and in some ways, I'm, I'm privileged to be here. Uh, I mean, I would have thunk it. You know, I grew up in, in a poor family in India, and, and here I am standing in front of this uh, August group here and, and talking about the talent factor and, and how we're going to be able to go ahead and deal with this question of feeding 9 billion. And for me, this question of 9 billion, this feeding 9 billion, it really, in, in some ways, uh, from the educational perspective, from the talent factor perspective, in, in many ways, it's a sort of a back to the future approach, as it were. And, and bear with me, and I'll walk you through this uh, over the next few minutes using several different slides and, and, uh, and talk about what I mean about this idea about back to the future as well. So, um, and, and comments that were made by Mary as well as uh, Hugh, they talked about societal challenges. And of course, the, the, the greatest societal challenge that we've got, obviously, is the population challenge. And, uh, you know, we're in, in just another 30 to 40 years, we're going to surpass 9 billion people. And in, in some ways, I think of the population challenge as a wicked problem, as, a, as the mother of all wicked problems. The reason I call it a wicked problem, wicked problems by definition, by the way, there's a guy named Horst Riddle, a German national who came up with this terminology back in the 1970s. And the idea behind wicked uh, problems is that you may have the greatest technology in hand, but you're not able to utilize that technology to address the particular problem because mere humans become involved in this and you cannot agree as to how you're going to be able to deploy that technology. And that's why these things are called, referred to as wicked problems. And, and population is the mother of all wicked problems because derived from that population wicked problem are all the other baby wicked problems, whether it's, we're talking about food or water or climate change or energy or health or poverty. All of these, I think, are baby wicked problems because if we did not have to deal with the population problem, we wouldn't have to worry about all these other problems. So they're truly derived from the population issue itself, this, this mother of all wicked problems. So that gives you a context of what we need to be doing. And, uh, and Hugh very eloquently pointed out the opportunities that we've got, particularly the young people that, have, that we have to be able to address this question of feeding the 9 billion that are going to be here very soon. So at the core of our ability to feed this population is going to be the farmer. And again, Hugh did it very nicely, very eloquently about the importance of agriculture itself, about the importance of, of farmers and ranchers and livestock producers. So at the core are the farmers. But the farmers are being subjected to all manner of abiotic and biotic stressors. And unfortunately, the, the, uh, the folks that are sitting in the front row probably can read some of the words that are on those uh, 
uh, abiotic and biotic stressors. The abiotic stressors are things related to environmental conditions, climate change, the lack of water, labor, uh, regulations, policies, and things like that. These are all, in quotes, non-living things that are having an impact on how farmers are able to do what they do. The bottom part of it is the biotic stressors. These would include everything from insects and pathogens and weeds on to genomics and genetics, the constraints that we've got in being able to feed the world. So these are the, the stressors that are having an impact on those producers. And the scientific community is trying to figure out how best to alleviate those stressors. In fact, many of the companies that are represented here, whether it's Monsanto or Dow AgriSciences or other companies that are trying to address these questions, the academic community that's trying to address these questions is really trying to figure out how to mitigate these abiotic and biotic stressors on the ability of farmers and, and livestock producers to produce the food that we need to be able to feed the population that's going to come down the pike, as it were, in just a few, few more years. So the proposition is that we're going to go ahead and feed and shelter and clothe. Oh, by the way, we're going to provide their fuel needs as well of this 9 billion people, greater than 9 billion people. And by the way, we're going to tie your hands behind your back because we're going to throw at you climate change and, and land and water constraints and increasing urbanization, you know, competition for land and water that you're getting from cities and that, you get, that, that farmer, farmers have to deal with as well. Environmental degradation, minimizing the ecological footprint, uh, changing incomes and diets. Look at what's happening in China and India and other countries with increasing uh, incomes they are now consuming more and more protein-based diets as well. A consequence of that is the greater pressures on land and water use that, is being there, that, that we have to deal with as well. And finally, oh, by the way, we want to make sure that you're going to derive some positive health benefits. You know, One of the scourges of modern food systems that we've got is issues related to obesity and, to, and type 2 diabetes and other health issues that we've got, even in countries. So in the United States, as some of you, or probably all of you know, We've got a, the scourge of uh, being overweight and obese. Almost about 60% of our population has weight issues in this country. In China, which is catching up very quickly, 30% of the population is having weight problems as well, obesity issues and, and being overweight. India is catching up with China as well. About 15 to 20% of the population is now uh, becoming overweight. And so you've got this yin and yang problem in countries like uh, India and countries in Africa as well, where you've got a whole bunch of people that are dying of starvation, and then you've got a whole bunch of people that are dying of excessive amounts of consumption of calories as well. And so we're going to throw all of this at you, and now you're going to be expected as scientists to be able to feed uh, this, this world that's coming with this population that's coming along uh, down the pike, as it were. So that gives you a context of the challenges that we've got to face. So from the perspective of the path forward, there are a number of paths forward. In, in the realm of uh, discoveries, I'm going to go through this very quickly. Uh, I, I do want to talk a little bit about the diversity of species. The amazing thing globally is we use only about 15 to 50 species of, these are plants, by the way. We have about 50,000 edible species. The big five, rice, wheat, corn, soybeans, these crops, Everybody consumes it. You know, I grew up as a rice eater in Asia. But now you go around the world, almost every day, even in America, for example, a lot of families end up, end up eating rice. And so we've got all these changes in, in our diets that are occurring. And a consequence of that is this concentration of reliance on just a few species for our dietary needs, as it were. And there are great opportunities for us to be thinking of the broader uh, diversity of species that are edible species that are available to us. In addition to that, there's a whole bunch of traits that we could be uh, uh, helping develop. And in fact, many of the companies represented here, many of the academic institutions represented here, have been working on trying to figure out how best to enhance these traits that, uh, that I've referenced here. In addition to that, there are unbelievable opportunities. We've barely scratched the surface in the realm of systems and synthetic biology and uh, on to improving efficiencies, whether it's feed to yield or heat tolerance or photosynthesis. All of these are opportunities just barely, we've made, barely made a dent in trying to figure out how best to improve on these various types of efficiencies as well. Finally, also in the realm of managing pre and post harvest losses. In fact, in the developed world, Today, like the United States, Western Europe, and other places, over 50% of the food is lost after the dinner table. And in the developing world, in Africa and Asia and Latin America, over 50% of the food ends up being lost before the dinner table. And if we were to be able to go ahead and mitigate those losses 
just by 50% on the pre-harvest side and the post-harvest side, we're going to be quite a ways to be able to feed the population as well, of this 9 billion that's coming down the pike. And so there's unbelievable need for research and education to be undertaken in pre- and post-harvest losses that we're encountering as well. Very little, there's a, not as much effort that's being invested in these areas. Additional paths forward in terms of uh, the costs attributable to water and nitrogen, the, the true costs. Uh, you know, we grow in the Midwest in the United States, we grow corn and we uproot it, as it were, and the water along with it and the amount of nitrogen that we put into it, and then we ship that corn off to other places around the world. Who's paying for that? So there's got to be some way to go ahead and account for the water and the nitrogen use and things like that as well. In addition to that, we truly need some transformative approaches. We've all been used to, we think of agriculture, the sort of the Norman Rockwell picture of agriculture as it were. The agriculture that we practice today is very similar to the agriculture that was practiced 10,000 years ago. There's not a whole lot of differences in the way we do things, uh, except for the fact that now we use uh, molecular biological techniques to uh, hasten the process of plant breeding and, and selection and things like that. But it's pretty much the same thing. You go ahead and you get your land prepared, you plant your seed, and you wait for it to sprout, and then you, maybe you do some irrigation, and then you go through and deal with the weeds and pests and things like that, and then maybe you go ahead and harvest it and move the food uh, products around. So it's pretty much the same thing that we've been doing for the last 10 to 15,000 years uh, around the world. We need some transformative approaches in, in the realm of perennial and multi-cropping, conversion of deserts, using algae maybe as a way to derive the foods that we need. In fact, there are a couple of companies that have come up with uh, 3D printing. Uh, this company called Modern Meadow Incorporated uh, has figured out how to grow protein in petri dishes and uh, with 3D printers they can print you a nice uh, uh, T-bone steak or a nice uh, uh, drumstick or something and in fact uh, I saw a picture of Bill Gates eating one of those drumsticks and apparently it tasted just like chicken by the way. And uh, so you've got these transformative approaches that we might ought to be thinking of. Trying to think of things other than the traditional agriculture that we've been practicing for all of these uh, millennia, as it were. Along with that, in, in the realm of logistics and mechanization, pest management, big data, in fact, you refer to this as well, there's unbelievable untapped potential in data itself that we've you know, just now started to think about how do we go ahead and data mine for the kinds of things that we can get out of it for these transformative approaches as well. In the realm of policy research in, and, and the needs for continued investment in research and, again, uh, going back to what Hugh referred to, these new partnerships that we need, these partnerships between public and private enterprises, non-governmental organizations, academic institutions, and others as well. It really needs to be done in a very different manner than it's been done for all of these past many, many years. In terms of farming systems, again, you know, I refer to the fact that the kind of farming that we do is pretty similar to what we've been doing for, for the past many, many millennia. And what about enhancing for the, the changing the productivity gap as it were. In fact, plant physiologists tell me that if we were to go in our productivity, that is yield, from about 1.5% is where we're at to about 2%, we're going to be able to go ahead and try to figure out how we're going to feed this population that's coming down the pike. Um, in addition to that, you've got the opportunity, particularly for smallholder farms, should we be looking at the, the cooperatives? And the, the Israelis have had tremendous success in being able to use cooperatives and uh, kibbutzes, as they called, in, in addressing the food needs of, their, of that particular nation. Is there not an opportunity for us to try to figure out how it's being done and transplant that into other areas as well? We used to do this. We had cooperatives. But then over time, we walked away from it. So it takes these sort of back to the future, as it were, things that we've done previously going ahead and, and in quotes, retrofitting to be able to utilize it as we go forward. Closed loop systems, integrated and diversified uh, farming systems. This particular farm on the bottom right hand side is a closed loop, integrated, diversified farming system where row crops are grown and some of it is fed to fish and the water that the fish are raised in, it contains a, 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 quite a lot of uh, ammonium uh, compounds that can be utilized as fertilizer. So it's a closed loop system and the system self-perpetuates itself and there's some opportunities that can be derived from looking at these sorts of new farming systems as well, particularly in the context of smallholder uh, situations as well. Uh, smart farming. 
Uh, again, you know, if you look at what's happening with the companies like Caterpillar and uh, John Deere and others, there's a lot of effort being invested in, uh, in fact, Hugh was referring to precision farming systems. And I, I like to call them smart farming systems. These are the robotics, these are the sensors, these are the sentinels that you could incorporate and that you utilize to be able to uh, address the food needs of the world of this, this growing population. Resilient intensification is another area there's a lot of interest in that we've been investing some efforts into. Uh, the idea is that in, in a sustainable manner in that small air, amount of land and water that we've got, try to increase, enhance the yields that we can get. Try to squeeze you know, the crop or drop, as it were, that Monsanto likes to talk about as well. Try to enhance, intensify the amount that you can get from the same amount of inputs that are being provided. Uh, Issues pertaining to vertical farming, hydroponics, aquaponics. The point of the matter is that these things are not mutually exclusive. We're going to have to figure out how best to do this in a sort of a, you know, all the tools available in our toolkit, as it were, to be able to figure out how best to go ahead and provide food. And it's all going to be context dependent and, and location dependent as well. Not any one particular tool is going to be amenable to be deployed in all parts of the world that there might be different mix and combinations of these different types of tools as well that we could utilize. So that gives you a sense of the kinds of things that are going on right now, by the way, in terms of developing new farming systems to be able to address the food needs. Uh, additionally, issues pertaining to policies and regulation and marketing are very, very critical. These are things that we don't think of. For the most part, what we've tried to do as humanity is we think that there's a magic bullet, that somehow Monsanto is going to come up with the next killer, pardon me for using that term, uh, application as it were in, uh, you know, in, in genetic modification or utilizing the tools of biotechnology. But those tools as we know, and you know, most recently this happened, right? We know that at the end of the day it is mere humans that end up making decisions. The human dimensions tend to have a very huge impact, the policies, the regulations, et cetera, that, that we need to be considering as well. These you know, pertain to issues related to governance, socially beneficial policies and programs, acceptance of technologies. And you know, particularly our agribusinesses in the world have been subjected to this, this, this acceptance of technology itself. People have a, uh, you know, particularly you know, if you look at what's happening in Europe and Japan and other places, they're loath to accepting these technologies. That in, here in America, we're very willing to go ahead and accept these technologies as well. Uh, along with that, issues pertaining to poverty reduction, issues pertaining to education, and issues pertaining to what I like to call as glocalization. You know, the old adage about uh, uh, act uh, locally, think globally, or whatever, however it goes, you know. So this idea about globalization, what, what are we doing locally that has an impact on the global context, and what do we do uh, at the global context that has an impact at the local level as well? And at the end of the day, it's also about jobs in the economy. It's not just about, in fact, Philippe and I were in the back talking about this. It's not just about the fact that you're going to give somebody some food, but it's also about the fact that you're going to enable them to be able to contribute to society and derive the benefits of that as well, i.e., having jobs that people can be involved in, the economic well-being of the communities that they live in as well. Um, then, having said all this about the, the great discoveries needed, and we've got unbelievable talent available, whether it's in the, the, the private enterprise world or in the academic world, we've got a lot of talent that's available that's being deployed right now to make these discoveries that we need. But along with that, we need to be investing our efforts in the educational realm, this talent factor that was referred to earlier by uh, Mary and by Hugh as well. So in my mind, the education pipeline, there are four domains to it, as it were. The first domain is the workforce itself. What I mean by that is that, for example, here in the United States, just in the next five years, based on surveys that we've done, we know we're going to have about almost 60,000 jobs available in the agribusiness enterprise. 60,000 jobs. And we're generating only about 28,000 graduates in America. That means we're falling short by over half of meeting the needs of the agribusinesses, uh, agribusiness enterprise in the United States. And you can multiply that multiple fold when you go, uh, go across the globe as well, because not enough people are wanting to get into the agricultural enterprise, although there are fantastic opportunities, and we need to be thinking of uh, helping develop the workforce. That's the first thing. The second thing is the scientific cadre that we need as well. We still need to be 
uh, investing effort to develop new PhDs and postdocs so that they can go and work in those laboratories of our world uh, and, and, and invent those new transformative approaches to be able to feed the world. The third area that we need to be consider, concerned about is the folks that translate this scientific knowledge into innovations, and those innovations serve as solutions to the problems people are facing, those extension cadres that we need as well. We, we've, in fact, in the United States, we've seen a very significant loss in capacity in the extension, amongst the extension cadre. And this has been happening, particularly in the last about uh, uh, three to five years or so, with the economic downturn in the United States, we've seen a very significant loss in our capacity in the extension uh, enterprise. And we're going to have to try to reinvigorate that uh, area. Last but not least is you can have the greatest discoveries, and they can sit on a shelf. But if you don't have somebody that's actually willing to work hard on the, out in the farm or on the ranch, as a livestock producer or as a, a farmer, all that's worthless. All those great discoveries mean nothing at all. And we've got fewer and fewer people actually wanting to go into the production business in the world. It's not just in the United States. In the United States, we've got less than 1.5% of our population that is involved in the production agricultural enterprise. In fact, this is happening in India, in China, in, in many countries in, the, in Africa as well. People, I think, personally think what's happening is humans are becoming wusses. Pardon me for using that word. Because people don't want to go work in the hot sun or get up at 4 in the morning to milk that cow, deal with the poop, deal with the manure, deal with the neighbors complaining and things like that. And I would, we would much rather go ahead and work in a nice air-conditioned bank or some such place and let somebody else worry about growing the food. We're going to have to figure out how to improve agricultural competitiveness so that farmers and ranchers can keep a few more dollars in there, a few more dollars or rupees or yen or whatever it is in their pockets as well. We've not done enough to make it attractive for young people to want to go into the agricultural production business. These are the four domains that we need to be thinking about from a, an educational perspective, as it were, as a path forward to be able to meet the food needs of the world when we're going to have this nine plus billion people in the world. So there have been a number of surveys that have been done in terms of the workforce. Uh, these data are from USDA, my department itself. And uh, uh, the jobs that are available in the agricultural world, this is all jobs as it were, 15% of the jobs becoming available in America. That's the, the uh, orange colored uh, pie there. Uh, this uh, laser pointer doesn't work. 15% of the workforce jobs that are going to become available in, in the United States are going to be in the agricultural world. Unbelievable opportunities for young people. And this is true not just in the United States, but in many other parts of the world as well. In fact, as, as you said, times could not be better for young people to want to get into the agricultural enterprise. There are unbelievable opportunities that are uh, be, uh, becoming available. As I said earlier, in, in the next couple of three years, we'll have over 55,000 jobs that are going to become available in the agriculture, food, and natural resources areas. And unfortunately, we're only producing, as I said, about half that number. And the other half, we somehow managed to get by having people come in from other disciplines, not from the agricultural disciplines, as it were, and we're able to limp along. And in fact, I've got friends in many of these companies that are represented here, and their, their constant lament is that they're not getting enough young people that have the skills and the talent to be able to go and work in those companies. They're willing to pay top dollar, as it were, but they're not able to get enough people to go and work in those enterprises. So the workforce needs are also affected by a number of changes that are taking place. Demographic changes. Looking at the United States, uh, we're becoming a nation demographically that's changing from an, a, 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 a Caucasian white society that is becoming more and more brown, as it were. In fact, in another, uh, by the year 2050, whites in America are going to become a minority because the minorities are now going to be the larger proportion of the population itself. In fact, in Oregon, the, the state from where I moved to Washington, D.C., in just another four years, in the year 2017, uh, 20, uh, 2018, the graduating high school class that's going to go to college one out of four kids is going to be of Hispanic descent in Oregon. And you go to California, you go to Texas, you go to Illinois and other states, this sort of demographic changes are occurring very, very rapidly. 
and we're not prepared to deal with these kids. By the way, many of these kids of Hispanic descent, they're children of undocumented workers, likely working in the agricultural enterprise, likely hate the idea about agriculture. They want to get away as far away from it as possible because they don't want to be doing what their parents have been doing. So how do we entice these young people to want to get into the agricultural enterprise is, a, is a, a, a thing that we need to be concerned about. Global competencies, you know, any more this idea about glocalization that I was referring to. Any more, every individual ha has to be globally competent. We've got to incorporate into the educational experiences to make sure that they develop those skills and those competencies as well. Many of the international students that used to come to America back in the good old days, about 20, 30 years ago, even 10 years ago, they would go ahead and stay put here in the States because there are great opportunities. I'm an example of that. I came from India to study here, and I got talked into staying put, and here I am. Okay? But today, you fast forward to today, many of the students that come from foreign countries, they'd much rather go back to their home countries because there are many, many more opportunities for them available back in their home countries that are paying, again, top dollar, as it were. By the way, the foreign-born population in the United States, this is the Census Bureau's latest data uh, that, that I saw. The other, uh, we had a, some people from the Census Bureau come to my agency to give a talk. It says to us that in the, by the year 2060, over 68 million people in the United States, we're going to have over 400 million people in the United States in the year 2060. Of that, about 15% of the population is going to be foreign-born. Okay? Now, that is another demographic change that we're going to have to think of as well. Plus, America is aging very rapidly. In fact, if you look at many parts of the world, it's a, a very, very rapidly aging population as well. What are, how do we deal with this sort of an aging population? How do we go ahead and find the replacements to go ahead and figure out to discover new knowledge, to translate that new knowledge and deliver it to the end users, and to actually grow those crops and raise those livestock as well? So that gives you a sense of the kinds of workforce needs that we've got as we're thinking about it right now as we project out to the year 2050. Okay? So basically, in the workforce needs, you're thinking of research, experiential education, uh, transdisciplinary skills. In fact, Hugh was referring to that, that it's not enough to have people that are you know, deep experts in a particular area. You really have to have this ability to, to uh, transcend the various disciplines that we've got, that you need to crowdsource the best knowledge together. So you've got to have those transdisciplinary skills as well. And, of individuals that have the skills to be able to translate and to transfer research to the end user as well, these extension type folks that we need as well. So, so the question that we have to ask ourselves is what does this mean as we train new researchers and extension agents and the workforce and the agricultural producers? How do we go ahead and provide them the educational experiences and the educational knowledge that need to, they need to have, the skills they need to have to be able to address the challenges that we've got to address? So, as I said in my opening statement, I think it is a sort of a back to the future idea, this path forward. Now, what do I mean by this back to the future? I want to take you through a bit of history out here now. So back in 1862, in the United States, we had the creation of what we call as the land-grant universities. And the act itself was the brainchild of a number of individuals. But today we call it the Morrill Act. This guy that's pictured here, his name is Justin Smith Morrill. He was a congressman at that time from the state of Vermont. And this act basically says, an act donating public lands to the several states and territories which may provide colleges for the benefit of agriculture and the mechanic arts. So the idea was that the United States government would provide 30,000 acres per senator and per representative to every state in the union. The state, in, the state could sell that land, take the proceeds, match those proceeds to create these land-grant universities, land-grant colleges, okay? Like Texas A&M University, like Purdue University, like the University of Illinois, et cetera. All right, but it was not just that America was gonna give away this land, you sell it, then you have a good time. There are certain expectations in the educational efforts that needed to be undertaken as well. The key is that Justin Smith Morrill and others came up with in the Land Grant Act was, and I've highlighted the words, the critical words in red, without excluding the scientific and classical studies. You gotta include that as well. Including military tactic to teach learning, agriculture, and the mechanic arts, and to promote a liberal and 
practical education. The critical pieces in here are military tactic, scientific and classical studies, agriculture and mechanic arts, and practical education. It's hands-on experiential education. That was the idea that was promulgated by Justin Smith Morrill as part of the Land Grant Act itself. Well, that was in 1862. Then, in 1893, there was the Committee of Ten that got together in Saratoga, New York, and they came out with their statement that what students need to be successful is that they got to have direct experience in the physical world, and that mere words of the teachers and the textbooks were not sufficient, and that the teachers should guide the students' thinking, critical thinking skills needed to be inculcated, and oh, by the way, set aside time for laboratory instruction and one afternoon per week be set aside for out of, out of door uh, instruction. So the idea again is practical education, critical thinking skills, that's back in 1892, okay? Then you come to eight, 1983, 100 years later, we have a report by, put out by the National Academy of Sciences called the A Nation at Risk. There's a lot of belly button examination that occurred here in the United States back in those days. It still occurs, by the way, today. A nation at risk that said that basically America's foundations of our society are being eroded by a rising tide of mediocrity. And it was this woe is me, you know, this chicken little running around saying that the, the world is going to collapse on me. And they made some recommendations. This panel of experts made some recommendations. Increase the graduation requirements in the STEM discipline, science, technology, engineering, and math, in English and social studies, foreign languages. Raise the expectations and standards. Increase the amount of homework that's being given. Improve teacher education. Increase teacher pay. And last but not least, hold everybody accountable as well. And accountability is a very critical piece of this. So that was back in 1983. And then you come to 1990. The AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, came out with what's called as Project 2061. By the way, Project 2061 refers to the fact that in the year 2061, Halley's Comet's going to be coming back. Back in the 1980s, Halley's Comet made a pass by Earth. So those, so those of you that are about my age or, or Hugh's age remember what happened during that time when Halley's Comet came along here. It's going to come back to us in 2061. By then, the AAAS calls for this that the students must become scientifically literate by integrating the disciplines, guiding themes, principles that unify the disciplines, and that students might ought to be taught the nature of science itself, that we're not doing a very good job of ensuring that the, the students are getting all of these skills being inculcated in them. Then in 2006, James Heckman, Heckman by the way, James Heckman is a Nobel laureate. He's an economist. Maybe he's a member of IFAMA. I don't know but he is an economist at the University of Chicago. And he has done some, uh, an unbelievable body of uh, work that he has done on the cognitive and non-cognitive skills. Cognitive skills are all the sort of the technical skills that there were. The non-cognitive skills are the so-called soft skills that we need. And based on their work, they say that the non-cognitive skills, they determine social and economic success. And that those non-cognitive skills, particularly in early childhood programs like Head Start and Perry Preschool Program here in the United States, are effective. They, the non-cognitive skills do not boost IQ by in and of themselves, but what they end up doing is they raise the skill level and promote success in those individuals that have been subjected to those sorts of enterprises. So it talks about the importance of non-cognitive skills. Okay? So you've got cognitive skills, that's the technical knowledge, and then the non-cognitive skills are the people skills, the soft skills, as it were, as we need. And in fact, in survey after survey, some of you have probably participated in the surveys as well, the blue bars here are all the so-called soft skills, by the way. They get ranked higher by future employers than the last two bars, the yellow and the green, are knowledge and skills in mathematics and science. In fact, these soft skills, these non-cognitive skills, are much more valued by future employers than are the cognitive skills. Because the determinant of success in their enterprises is 
really those non-cognitive skills, okay? Another study that was done, again, demonstrates that these non-cognitive skills, these soft skills such as communications, decision-making, self-management, teamwork, professionalism, experiences and leadership are important uh, skills that, that students might ought to be developing in being able to be successful in the efforts that they're gonna be involved in. Then comes in 2007, America Competes Act. And it talks about the fact that we need to be investing in innovation and competitiveness to make sure that America retains its global preeminence in all of its various enterprises. And as part of that, they talk about, again, STEM education being important, science, technology, engineering, and math, and that enhancement of capabilities and coordination of experiences, research experiences, is very, very important. It's not enough to go sit in a classroom and study from a textbook or hear the words of the teacher that you gotta have those practical skills as well that are inculcated in you. Then comes the National Academy of Sciences in 2009, transforming agricultural education for a changing world. And what they talk about is, and again, this is one of these uh, uh, woe is me, you know, the world's gonna collapse now if we don't do something about it. If institutions do not address change, then agriculture may become the colleges of agriculture may become irrelevant, and graduates will have difficulty in keeping up with the changing needs of society. And the nation, America, will miss its opportunity for leadership in addressing the global challenges related to food and agriculture. So these are, again, National Academy of Sciences members here opining on the fact that we need to be very concerned about America's global preeminence and make sure that the educational opportunities that are being provided are gonna be relevant and that the students that are graduating will have all of the skills that, that they need as well. So, really coming back to, so, you know, that gives you the historical context. And I want to take you back to the Morrill Act itself, the Land Grant Act itself of 1862. What it talked about was three things. The first thing is foundational knowledge in the humanities and sciences that every student must have, that foundational knowledge. Secondly, that they must have practical, hands-on experiential education in the agricultural and mechanical arts. And thirdly, they gotta have military leadership skills. And so when you think about foundational knowledge, practical education, and leadership skills, they're either cognitive skills or non-cognitive skills. And that's what's been talked about. Going back to 1862, people were thinking about the need for not just textbook knowledge, but that people needed to have foundational knowledge and practical knowledge and leadership skills as well, these soft skills as, as it were. So, there's a coalition called the Coalition for a Sustainable Agricultural Workforce. Many of the companies represented here provided funding for them to undertake a survey. And the survey basically said that, you know, start younger, get hands-on experience. These are the companies saying these words, by the way. And, by the way, these companies are expecting to hire over 1,000 scientist-level FTEs. That's the full-time equivalent. An individual is called a full-time equivalent, by the way. 1,000 positions. In the next two years, okay, that constitutes 13% of the scientific workforce today. I got these data just day before yesterday from the fellow that did the survey. And even Monsanto was part of it, Hugh. I'm sure you know about that. Uh, that provided that information as well. And that 84% of the total of these 1,000 positions is gonna be needed in the plant sciences, in plant breeding, plant genetics, plant protection, et cetera. So there's unbelievable opportunities for young people, as you said, for a lot of the young people sitting here that are gonna be about 60 years of age in another 30 to 40 years, you have great opportunities to be able to address the food needs of the world uh, coming along. So looking at what's going on in the land-grant universities and how they're preparing the 21st century workforce, I did a survey of the land-grant universities here in the last uh, three weeks. And basically I asked a few questions, okay? Do you have food and agricultural courses in your institution as a general education course for the entire student body? Okay, uh, in large measure, the challenges that we've got with food in, in America and the world is there's very little knowledge about food and agriculture itself. The second question was, do you encourage study abroad? Uh, third question was experiential learning. Fourth question was leadership courses. Fifth question was online courses. And the last question was, have you revised your curricula or your majors or your courses in relation to this question about the nine billion challenge that we've got? And it tells you 
uh, the, the red is yes and no is blue and plan to is green. And uh, you can see the data there, I'm not gonna walk you through this, that some institutions are stepping up, they're making the changes. In fact, if you look at the last question, uh, 10 of the uh, 27 institutions that responded have indeed uh, uh, done, made some changes already into their curricula in making sure that the students are gonna have the skills that are necessary. University of Nebraska, some of you know about this institution. And, and maybe there are people represented here from the University of Nebraska. They've really taken it head on, this idea about this nine billion question and making sure that the students are gonna have the skills necessary. And, and they're integrating uh, uh, these disciplines that are relevant in the food and agricultural area. They've created new bachelor's degrees in integrated sciences with transdisciplinary studies that are required. They have uh, uh, created uh, leadership programs and there's a required course that every student at the University of Nebraska has to take. We're not talking about students only in the agricultural disciplines, but every student has to take as a core general education course. And that talks about the global needs and about sustainability as well. So I think they're a leader. University of Nebraska is indeed a leader in this sort of an enterprise. Uh, there are other universities, uh, you know, uh, Florida, UC Davis, Iowa State, Virginia Tech, and many, many other universities that are incorporating all these changes as well. But the interesting thing about all these institutions is that they're also thinking about where do you get these innovations in education? One of those is starting at a very young age. And in fact, uh, Hugh referred to that, and I think Mary referred to that as well. Can we go deeper down into the high schools, into the grade schools? Fourth grade, I think, is the term that Hugh used in his comments that he made. Um, enhanced partnerships between high schools and colleges and universities. Resurrecting Ag in the Classroom. We have a program called Ag in the Classroom that my agency provides funding for. We reach out to six million children in the United States. What's the possibility we could reach out to the 80 million children we have in America? What's the possibility we could incorporate curricula like that for the entire you know, uh, child population in the world to teach them home, home economics uh, uh, courses and things like that as well. We've walked away from it and I think it's, it's high time that we start thinking about reinvigorating, reintroducing these agricultural disciplines in the high schools, in grade school itself, so that there's greater awareness of the food and agricultural enterprise as it were. Hands-on experiences in, at, at various levels, whether science fairs or internships for undergrads and, and high school students, competitions, uh, attracting the best and brightest. There's all manner of constraints and opportunities. Uh, the cost of education is growing up like crazy in this country. As you know, tuition is increasing at a much more rapid rate than even healthcare costs. And a consequence of that is we're getting these for-profit institutions like the University of Phoenix that you sit at your computer terminal and you take these courses and you get a degree, undergraduate degree or a graduate degree, but you have zero skills in terms of your people skills, you have zero skills in terms of your practical education. How are you gonna be able to address the needs that we've got, the challenges that we need to be addressing as well? That's a very, something that we need to be thinking about. Ag's image problem. You know, last year in the month of April, there was an article that was published that said, useless degrees in agriculture and animal science was number one Horticulture was number four, and uh, that's what was published. And the interesting thing is, if you look at the earnings potential and the job placement, you know, students graduating with a degree in agricultural economics, they can start with a BS degree, they can start with a salary of about sixty to $65,000 a year. A student with an animal science degree can start in a job, undergraduate degree here in the States, with a salary of about $55,000 a year. So those salaries are really, really good for a BS degree, by the way. So we don't talk enough about the possibilities, the potential for earnings, and by the way, students that are graduating with degrees now from institutions like Iowa State, Purdue, et cetera, are getting one or two or three job offers as soon as they graduate. Even, in fact, even before they graduate, these kids are a hot commodity and they're being placed. And we gotta be able to talk about this, tell the story about how great, how cool agriculture is so we can attract young people to come in, so we can deal with the, the question of this nine billion that we gotta feed. 4-H and other informal education systems and community colleges. We don't do enough with community colleges. We, you know, the idea about creating these two plus two articulations building agricultural curricula into community colleges. And by the way, they are a fantastic gateway for minority populations and rural populations to get into the four-year colleges and four-year universities as well. 
public-private partnerships. And in fact, uh, Hugh referred to that as well. One of the things that I did when I was at Purdue University and, and at Oregon State University was to develop master agreements with various companies. And what the master agreements allowed us to do was to put proprietary constraints so that the companies were comfortable that their proprietary information was not going to be you know, divulged to others. That was a great way to put the proprietary constraints. And what ended up happening was the university co-funded. It was not like we were seeing uh, Monsanto as sugar daddy with deep pockets, but we wanted to have skin in the game as well. So we were putting money on the table collaboratively and working together to be able to attract students to come into the agricultural disciplines. And we started creating a pathway, a pipeline, as it were, of, for internships and externships, including at field stations. The field stations might be in Puerto Rico or in, in China or India or in rural communities in Mississippi and other places. You know, you've got PhD scientists that are located over there. You can go ahead and place young people at those field stations as well. They're developing those practical uh, skills, as it were. That's a very important part of helping develop the future cadres that we need. Mentoring and leadership opportunities as well. That, can you imagine a young person that can shadow a Hugh Grant as he is doing his business as CEO? What a fantastic way to get young people to learn skills as, as, they, as they see on a day-to-day -day basis what Hugh Grant is doing in his uh, everyday life. And guest lecture. Today, with the technology that we've got, you can have a scientist at uh, a Monsanto uh, facility in, in Ames, Iowa, or Ankeny, Iowa, as, uh, as you said. And that individual can offer lectures to plant breeding classes and genetics classes and other classes. It might be 1,000 miles away, 10,000 miles away. We can use the technology to be able to deliver that knowledge as well. So that knowledge can be shared very readily with uh, uh, the entire community of uh, participants. So the path forward, really, it, whether in, the, in those different domains that I referred to, whether it's the workforce or the scientific cadre or the extension cadre, or the producers, the people that actually we need to be able to grow the crops and raise the livestock. The key is to think of, as the, as the students come through the educational institutions, we need to make sure that we help inculcate in them the cognitive skills, the technical knowledge that they need, but along with that, the non-cognitive skills. And oh, by the way, overlay on top of it, a lot of experiential education as well. Those are very, very critical pieces that you've got to incorporate into the educational enterprise that we develop these young people to be able to address these challenges that we've got. So, so the path forward really is back to the future. In fact, Justin Smith Morrill in the Land Grant Act, in the Morrill Act, talked about foundational knowledge in the humanities and sciences, practical education in the agricultural and mechanical arts, and military leadership. Those are the cognitive and the non-cognitive skills. So it's not something new that we need to be inventing. Like Hugh, I'm very optimistic. I think we can do this. We can lick this problem. It's, we're, it's in our hands to be able to do that. And it really is rethinking what we've been doing in the educational enterprise, particularly in the last about 30 or 40 years, I think. We have uh, uh, sort of disinvested in the educational enterprise around the world, disinvested in making sure that the young people develop not just the cognitive skills, not just the textbook skills, but they're getting those practical skills and those non-cognitive skills as well. So I'm very optimistic. In fact, looking around the room here, and I interact with a lot of young people around the world, and I'm, I'm, I'm jazzed at how smart these people are, these young folks are, and I'm really jazzed, I'm very optimistic we're gonna be able to lick this problem of feeding the nine billion. Thank you very much.